G'day everyone and welcome back to this Share Cafe Hidden Gems webinar. Uh, it's the start of the year. I'm coming to you live from downtown Byron Bay, uh, back in the office next week. Today we're discussing animal health, medical technology and payment and lending solutions. We've only got three companies on today. Now, if you'd like to see a particular company present this year, feel free to reach out. Um, Spender, who are on the webinar today, was the result of many investors asking us to get the company on the webinar today and to reach out. So don't be afraid to send us an email and ask for any particular company and we'll chase them for you. Um, also, don't forget to ask questions. There's a Q&A box provided. Don't put your hand up. We can't see you. Type the questions in the Q&A box provided and we'll go from there. So let's make a start. As I said, only three companies today. First up, we have a VCO, ASX code AVE. It's got a market cap around $26 million. We have with us Paul Gavin, who's the CEO. A VCO develops and commercialises innovative human health and animal health products using their proprietary drug delivery system, TPM. Paul, thanks for your time. Over to thank you. you. Thank you, and, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your time today. So uh, as you've heard, my name is Dr. Paul Gavin. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Aveco Biotechnology. Uh, we're a Melbourne-based uh, company with a novel formulation technology called TPM. Now, our background is pharmaceutical drug development for traditional non-cannabis uh, medicines, but the expertise that we have developed over the last 20 years is directly applicable to a whole range of shortcomings that affect the broad uh, global cannabis industry. So today I'm going to talk to you about our pharmaceutical uh, TPM enhanced cannabidiol or CBD capsule that we've been developing over the last uh, couple of years. It's heading into our pivotal phase three clinical trial in Australia this year, uh, and we're positioning ourselves to exploit the lucrative global cannabis markets using this uh, and other TPM enhanced products. So next slide, please. And there's our safe harbor statement. Yep. So look, before I get into the product itself, uh, I just wanted to highlight why cannabinoids are such a good fit for a, a VECO. So cannabinoids are the molecules in cannabis. Uh, many countries around the world have enacted some sort of legislation to make them uh, legal to be prescribed for medicinal purposes. Other countries around the world have already enacted legislation for consumer and recreational markets. But because it's been illegal for so long, is the normal R&D that you would normally conduct onto formulation development and clinical trials and all the rest, it just doesn't exist. And so the formulations that are currently available to patients are very crude, simple oil formulations for the most part, or, or even flour. And so we all know that moving forward as the industry matures, uh, a range of more acceptable sort of pharmaceutical dosage forms are going to be required to fulfill the needs of patients, physicians and consumers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> However, the cannabinoids themselves suffer from a range of technical issues that make them very difficult to formulate, essentially. So they are oil-soluble molecules with poor uh, solubility in water. And like most other oil-soluble molecules, they have very, very poor oral bioavailability. So that, what that means is uh, whatever you eat, um, cannabis products that you eat, you only absorb sort of 3 to 8% of the cannabinoid molecules and all the rest is metabolized and excreted and has no value. So this presents real challenges for developing uh, formulations that can deliver cannabinoids to the body efficiently. So look, if you can increase the absorption, which we call bioavailability, um, you can potentially have a product that has greater therapeutic effect. You can look at new clinical indications that have previously been unreachable because they needed really high doses. You can reduce the amount that a, a patient needs to take for a cost saving. And where we come in is really commercial differentiation because all around the world already, cannabis is simply a commodity. There's no differentiation. It's a race to the bottom with price and there's very little um, differentiation that's a, a real uh, commercial advantage. Next slide, please. And so the, the differentiation is really where we come in. So as I said, we've got a proprietary technology called TPM. Now, when you add TPM to systems that contain water, it self-assembles into tiny little nanoparticles less than the width of a human hair, and these nanoparticles can encapsulate and solubilize drug. And this works particularly well with oil-soluble molecules that have poor solubility in water, like the cannabinoids. That's essentially what you can see in this picture here. So the vial on the right is CBD in, in a vial of mostly water, and you can see it's undissolved. It sits there as a solid aggregate. Um, you can't do anything with that as a product. The vial on the left is exactly the same formulation with a little bit of our TPM added. Nanoparticles form, they encapsulate the drug, and they make an evenly soluble product 
that you can use for a variety of dosage forms. And so when we see this kind of profile, you know, this with and without TPM comparison, the last 20 years of experience tell us that we can develop products that have increased oral absorption or increased topical and transdermal absorption for products that you would apply to the skin. And when we saw this kind of profile that you can see in this image, we really decided that it's up to us to start developing uh, pharmaceutical dosage forms of CBD because that's a real gap um, in the global medicinal cannabis uh, market. Next slide, please. So the first thing is we did, we did, we started to optimize formulation for absorption. And so this was a process that started in Australia and then went to Denmark and then went to the US. And essentially what you're looking at in these two graphs here is increased absorption of CBD in two different animal models, a rat and a dog, when given with our TPM compared to standard dosage forms. So the graph on the left is rats. The tiny, tiny little red bar that you can see on the left is a product which is just CBD dissolved in a carrier oil called MCT. That's how it's prescribed to patients currently around Australia and most of the world. You can see it's got really, really poor absorption. Now the graph, you know, the TPM one, two, and three to the right of that, they're all different TPM formulations. The one on the right led to an increase in CBD absorption of about 40 times uh, compared to that. So that was pretty exciting. The, the graph on the right is the same formulations in dogs. This has an additional additive, which is a product called Epidiolex. So Epidiolex is currently the only FDA approved CBD product on the planet. So it was developed by GW Pharma. It's for a rare, couple of rare orphan indications around childhood epilepsy. So it's not prescribed to that many uh, patients, um, but it's the only approved product on the planet. And despite um, the orphan indications, uh, it was uh, that company, uh, GW Pharma, was acquired a year and a half ago by Jazz for $7.2 billion US. So that's how valuable a registered pharmaceutical cannabinoid product could be. So as you can see on the graph on the right, again, MCT delivers very poorly, Epidiolex delivers very poorly. Our formulation, which is in the clinical trials, has about a 400% increase uh, compared to Epidiolex in dog models. Next slide, please. And so this is a, a summary slide of what we've done really over the last three years. We've run very, very fast on these pharmaceutical products. We saw a gap. The last 20 years of, of biotech experience allowed us to run this fast. And so we've essentially completed the formulation development. As you've seen, we've, we've proven in two different animal models. We've got this increased absorption. We took this product and engaged Catalan in the US and they turned it into a pharmaceutical uh, soft gel capsule, which you know they finished in May of 21. It contains 75 milligrams of ultra pure synthetic CBD. So we know all the regulatory agencies around the world prefer synthetic drugs to natural botanical extract because they're high, pu high purity, they're very reproducible. The regulatory agencies far prefer them. The product is on ongoing stability, but it looks really good so far. So the first patches, batches of the past a year and a half, we only need to hit two years and it's a, a stable product and it looks fantastic so far. We've completed the early human trials in Australia, um, phase one PK studies, which are an important part of a product label and a TGA and FDA submission. And the big ticket item is we just before Christmas got ethics approval for our pivotal phase three clinical trial, which will be conducted in Australia in a sleep related indication this year. Now the product is initially seeking approval with the Australian TGA, which is unheard of. As a biotech, we would never proactively uh, ordinarily deliver a product, develop a product first for Australia. You always go for the US, but there's a very unique opportunity with Australia right now with the TGA, and they're incentivizing people to do clinical trials to register CBD, because if you are successful, CBD can be registered as an over-the-counter medicine, which essentially means you can walk into any pharmacy in the country and buy CBD direct from the chemist, instead of going to a GP and getting a prescription and all the rest. So you've got direct access to 26 uh, million people. The, the difficulty is who knows how to do clinical trials and, and develop product. And so really there's only a handful of us left uh, in this race for registration. Now our products, um, anything with TPM has patent protection, but this specific product, we filed two additional patents. They're in PCT stage. Uh, they'll go into grant uh, starting sort of middle of this year. Next slide, please. And so I guess why sleep? There are a couple of things we could have started with. We started with sleep essentially because of this OTC indication opportunity. 
Um, but you know, 40% of Australians aren't sleeping. 60% of us are experiencing poor sleep three to four times a week. Only 20% of us are sleeping uninterrupted. Essentially, the entire country is a potential customer. We're spending 250 bucks, $250 million a year in Australia alone on existing medications with unwanted side effects. And it costs the Australian economy about $19 billion uh, a year. Now, we spoke to the TGA. The TGA confirmed that insomnia was an appropriate indication um, for this over-the-counter opportunity. And so it's been um, all systems go. It's taken us a long time to design this study, um, really most of last year, because we are we are adamant that this trial has to be designed appropriately. So it's of, of value, not just for Australia, but also uh, the US and Europe. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And so what does the immediate development program look like? So as I say, we've got three years of work on it, ticking off a lot of the, the goalposts along the way. There are three main pillars remaining. The first is around the, the manufacturing. So we've now got three manufacturers overseas that can manufacture the product. We're about to put the what's called the registration batches down. They are the ones that go into your formal TGA and FDA submission. So that'll be hopefully this quarter and that'll start the clock ticking there. And we'll spend the rest of this year building the CMC dossier for a subsequent TGA registration. And then the big ticket item is this phase three trial. So as I say, the study design's finalized. We've engaged everyone that's gonna be on the study. We know everyone who's involved, it's all ready to go. We got ethics approval just before Christmas um, and we're just scheduling now the timing of that study. But we think clinical supply will be available uh, sort of by the end of Q1 and hopefully we commence dosing um, in Q2. But it's a phase three clinical trial and that's what biotech works towards because it's a huge inflection point because um, if you get success there, then you can kind of write your own ticket, especially as we've seen for a pharmaceutical um, CBD product. Next slide, please. And so I mentioned at the start, maximizing value and, and sort of how do we intend to do that? So as I say, all our resources are really going into this phase three clinical trial, but CBD around the world is being prescribed for everything right now. Um, it won't work for everything. Let me make that clear. We'll all start to discover the indications it doesn't work for. Um, but while we focus on sleep, there's opportunity to license the capsule to other companies for other indications that we don't have the bandwidth or the resources to chase ourselves. We can also license it into different markets. So not just pharma, but you know, consumer and medicinal and even recreational and also subdivided by territory. So the global cannabis market at the moment is about $20 billion. $20 billion despite the fact that it's crude dosage forms, there's no differentiation, it's essentially a commodity. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to do well um, in this space. And so, Really, I guess our company used to be in the business of developing entire pipelines of products, but now we have really a single product that can become an entire pipeline. Next slide, please. And so the strategy is already working. So we've already licensed the capsule for arthritis uh, to a US pharmaceutical company. So we're hoping they submit to the FDA their IND hopefully this quarter and they'll pay for all the development in arthritis. And if they fail, they fail on their money. If they succeed, then we get you know royalties and, and cuts of an indication that we didn't have the bandwidth to chase ourselves. So that's particularly exciting. Uh, we've, we've put our first toe in the water into the recreational cannabis space. We don't intend to do that directly ourselves. We're sticking true to biotech, but we're very comfortable to license our technology and our products to other people in recreational cannabis in the US so that they can derive value and again, pay us for the TPM and the royalties and all the rest. And so um, that's looking quite good. There's a lot of interest overseas at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. But recently, I guess we announced a couple of things on our non-cannabis side. So again, I mean, we've been 20 years of biotech and pharmaceutical development, and we're bringing that expertise to cannabis. It's not that we've sprung up out of medicinal cannabis in the last five minutes. Uh, this is what we do for a living. And so just before Christmas, we announced a licensing deal with uh, Perigo in the US. Perigo are a large uh, US or global consumer packaged goods company. Um, and they licensed one of our enhanced topical products. So ibuprofen, uh, they'll pay for all the clinical development for a US registration. Um, yeah, and if it's successful and registered in the US, we'll get royalties, milestones and all the rest. And we've just taken with another partner, Athenex, a separate product, which you can see in the picture, vitamin K, uh, that's gone to the FDA in a pre-IND. So they're essentially petitioning the FDA that, you know, this TPM enhanced vitamin K product 
can replace a lot of the nasties associated with vitamin K that's uh, currently on the US. And so we're hoping that's just the first injectable. And there are a whole lot of um, FDA uh, injectables using TPM that are available with, with partners for subsequent development. Next slide, please. So uh, yeah, last couple of slides, this is just a quick company snapshot as, as of the end of Q3. You know, we had just over $2 million in the bank. As you heard at the start, the market caps about you know 30 million, uh, give or take any given day. The top 20 shareholders um, have about 40% uh, of the company. Um, I mean, you obviously hear it from everyone, but you know we think obviously we're undervalued. But I mean, I just put it to you that obviously a, a company going to phase three clinical trials, and especially if we're successful with our phase three clinical trial, we're expecting a lot of interest, uh, not just locally, but uh, overseas from big pharma um, who are watching the space uh, with great care um, to see who's successful in, in the pharmaceutical cannabinoid front. Last slide, please. Next one. And so, yeah, these are the real main value drivers over the next year, a phase three clinical program. Um, as I mentioned, you know, that's the big ticket item in biotech. It's the big inflection point, getting to a phase three trial and trying to get that across the line. We've got a proprietary differentiated patent protected uh, formulation. Um, we are best placed to actually get success in phase three and subsequent registration. We'll be updating the market about um, our manufacturing because as we're successful there, we can start taking that product off and getting into the consumer markets as quickly as we can. We didn't touch upon, um, we've got, we did last year a couple of additional dosage forms. So topical transdermal CBD, we took into a phase two osteoarthritis study and that actually worked really well for a small study. And we've got um, a lot of discussions underway with that product and we'll be doing further clinical trials on the topicals this year. We hope to see, I'm um, pretty comfortable that there'll be further partnering and licensing opportunities across new markets, new territories and new indications. And um, what we've done as well in the last year is, is we have all these CBD dosage forms, but we took CBD out of all of them. We replaced them with THC and CBC and CBN and all the other cannabinoids. And they're all down on stability and undergoing assessment now. So we've multiplied the number of products available for uh, licensing opportunities over the coming year. And just the last point is not to forget our pharmaceutical pedigree. So a couple of agreements in the last month with Perigo and Athenex, there's further interest around further products, which we hope to consolidate over the next um, couple of months. And so before we know it, we're going to have a whole range of products in a whole range of clinical development programs, most of which will be paid for by uh, other people. So um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, happy to open the floor to questions. Thanks, Paul. Um, we do have quite a few questions. I am a CBD oil, oil user myself. I find it uh, uh, fantastic to help me sleep. Um, just in regards to now, the CAM group announced uh, this week that their CBD product failed for sleep in phase three trial. Um, how is your product or trial design different such that it would expect to succeed? Yeah, look, we did know that. That did come out yesterday. That really was a shame for the entire industry. We, you know, we, none of us actually want to see <laughs> our peers in the space fail, um, but we are very different to CAN. So um, CAN, our medicinal cannabis company, CAN's legacy skill is, is growing, you know, cannabis and extracting cannabis and all the rest. We are biotech and formulation development and clinical trials. That's 20 years of, of what we've been doing. So while I can't specifically comment on the different absorptions between our two products, we know ours has significant increase in, in absorption, but we, we haven't actually played with those. But we do know our trials are very, very, very different. So the thing about CBD and all these cannabinoids um, to realize is that Australia, we are all pioneers in this space. So because of what's happened with the TGA and this opportunity for over-the-counter registration, there are placebo-controlled phase three trials happening in Australia at greater concentration for these indications than anywhere else in the world. So everyone's watching and we're, we're all kind of pioneers. Um, but our study itself is much larger than any of the others. So if you don't know what effect size you'll see or you suspect it'll be a small effect size, you need lots of patients. So we, we are going to dose over double the patients that can dose in their trial to maximize the chance of seeing anything. We have a much tighter inclusion criteria. So CAN's patients and some of the others are really kind of mild in severity. 
we've got much tighter inclusion criteria around our patients. So we get much clearer reproducible uh, signals in the data. The, um, we're controlling to a degree for the placebo effect. So the placebo effect is what will kill these studies. Um, I think I did an interview a couple of months ago with cannabis. So they're all subjective endpoints. Um, and if you, if you don't know how to control for the placebo effect, it'll kill you when you come to your analysis. Um, and irrespective of all those things, we're doing a higher dose than CAN. So CAN only went to um, 100 milligrams of, of CBD in their trial. We're going up to the full 150. So that's even before you account for an increase in absorption. So we've tried to make this study as bulletproof as we can. Does it mean that we are guaranteed to, to succeed? Of course it doesn't. But if CBD does anything for sleep, we will capture it in the clinical trial design that we've put together. And, and Paul, just finally, we've probably run out of time. Um, can you give us an idea, and you mentioned partnership, can you give us an idea of, of your funding requirements over the next 12 months? Sure. So we've got enough money in the bank to kick off and commence the phase three clinical trial. We don't have enough money in the bank to complete the phase three clinical trial, but we're taking care of that now. We're, um, we're, we've got a couple of additional uh, licensing agreements that we are looking to consolidate over the next period of time. And, and that will decide, that will determine how much additional capital comes in to start um, running the phase three trial. But in the event that, um, you know, they look good, then we won't need any additional capital. In the event they don't bring in the entirety of the of the uh, required capital, then we'll obviously get it from other sources. But obviously this phase three clinical trial is, um, we will not skimp and look to underfund this and cut any corners, especially as a result of what happened with CAN yesterday. So we will be making sure that um, we have all the capital required to drive this to its full rigor. Dr. Paul Gavin, thanks for your time. Um, we'll get you back uh, later in the year. Good luck for 2023. No worries. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have LBT Innovations, ASX Code LBT. We welcome back their CEO, Managing Director, Brent Barnes. The company is a groundbreaking designer of advanced technology solutions for the medical industry. Brent, nice to see you again. Happy thanks, 2023. Tim. Over to you, mate. All right, thank you uh, very much. Great to be on again, and happy New Year for all the all the listeners. Uh, look, let's just jump into the first slide because from from a company perspective, it's um it's been a really busy kind of holiday period. And for those investors, perhaps who are new to the story, uh, there are a number of significant milestones that we've been able to deliver um, right at the end of last year and the start of this year. Um, and this slide kind of summarizes um, some of those. And you'll see on the right-hand side, a number of big names that are associated with, uh, with these key uh, announcements. Look, on the commercialization front, um, we've really expanded our market opportunity in Europe by appointing Thermo Fisher. Uh, if you recall, Thermo Fisher have been our US exclusive distributor for about a year. And following that really positive start of distribution and commercial traction, in the United States, it's been really pleasing to expand that distribution agreement to cover, to, to cover all of Europe. Um, and so when you think about where we were focused before in Europe, it was the Ger Germany, the UK and France, so kind of three countries. Well, now we're expanding that market through this distribution agreement with Thermo Fisher to cover all the Western, all the Eastern Europe. So it adds about 34 countries to, to that portfolio. Clearly, it's going to take some time and we'll go through the training uh, with Thermo Fisher, but that expansion is, is, is one that, that is significant. That's probably another 500 uh, odd customers to our um, total addressable market opportunity. So a big deal there in terms of commercialising uh, and, and expanding our market there in Europe with a really trusted name who's performed extremely well from a distribution perspective for us uh, in the United States. In terms of product development, We've got funding or received funding through a new agreement with AstraZeneca, uh, as well as Thermo Fisher. And, and what this does is funds some tech, uh, technology development and gets us into a brand new vertical within environmental monitoring. Specifically, it's looking at microbial quality control uh, testing, which is something that, that, that occurs with drug manufacturing. So drug manufacturing is done in a sterile environment or a clean room environment, and they put these uh, agar plates in to, to monitor from a quality control and quality assurance uh, perspective. 
So, you know, look, what we've really achieved just over, you know, the, the end of last year and moving into this year is that we've secured some non-dilutive funding um, and it's really to expand our existing platform. So not starting again or not going on in, into any tangent. It's really based on what we've been able to, to deliver on the current platform, get funding to expand that platform into new verticals, um, which are in their own right, extremely large. And I'll talk about uh, that a little bit more as well as forming partnerships um, and, and in the case of Thermo Fisher, extending an existing partnership. And so we've got really some really strong backers behind the product and clearly they are advocates uh, of, of the technology. So look, that, that just kind of summarizes some recent key achievements. I don't think the market have, has really understand that. So this is the first time I'm actually being able to, to, to get that into the market. Uh, look, next slide kind of just talks about who we are and what our mission is. Uh, and that's really all about um, transforming the way microbiology practices occur. And, you know, really specifically the Petri dish or, or the culture plate, that's the, the key area. This is a 130 year old kind of uh, invention, if you like, that um, around the world today is still very manual, manual in the way the plates are processed, manual in the way the plates uh, are interpreted. And so we're really looking to digitize and to bring that kind of technology up into the into the 21st uh, um, century. And our technology disrupts this environment. Um, and from a maturity perspective, you'll get an idea as I talk through where we're at, where we've got a product, we're in commercialization when we've got big partners behind us. So we've, you know, we've de-risked I'm not talking to you about a product that's an invention or something that would be great to do. We've, we've actually gone through all of that exercise and, and we're in the commercialization uh, phase. And I think this picture on the right there is a great example of uh, bringing that to life. And so th this is the Health Services Lab in London. Uh, they're part of the Sonic Group and they purchased two instruments and um, a, a great indication of, of our products already being used uh, in the market. Next slide talks about uh, the market opportunity you know, only in the clinical space. So I'll talk a bit more about the new market opportunity within pharma, but uh, really our focus has been on, on this core invention is getting into the clinical market. Um, uh, and, and to that extent, it's kind of infectious diseases. So kind of think a, a urinary tract infection, um, think about um, golden staph identification, think about superbugs and antimicrobial resistance. They're the kind of, um, um, uh, I guess, infectious disease um, disciplines that we're looking to provide automation to. And the picture there kind of gives a, a really good indication of what a typical lab would look like. And, and in this case, it's manually looking at uh, a Petri dish, uh, providing some interpretation and then manually keying in um, that information into the computer laboratory information management system to, to provide those results. So a very manual process that exists today. Uh, the, the other kind of macroeconomic uh, feature that we're seeing is, is a shortage of qualified microbiologists. There are there are just simply not enough microbiologists coming through the university system. And, you know, that's causing a, an increased uh, vacancy rate. We see that across the board. But even, you know, pre-COVID, where we've seen it get a little bit worse, uh, it, it's increased to about 10% of microbiology jobs in the U.S., um, are vacant at any time. And that's significantly increasing uh, wages. So the average wage now of a microbiologist, depending on their level of, of seniority, is anywhere from 160 to 180,000 US dollars. So, you know, the market's growing, infectious diseases are growing, superbugs, you know, uh, are classified as a real issue from the World Health Organization. And so we're talking about a global market opportunity that has not got enough staff, that has not got a lot of automation uh, currently uh, and is and is growing. So a great time to be in this diagnostic space uh, through the instrumentation. And the next slide kind of summarizes how we're leading the way uh, in this digitization, you know, bringing this manual review of microbiology up to the 21st century, where we're uh, really applying a machine vision capability. And that's really what our core invention is. And that's where our IP, our, our portfolio of patents exist. It's the way that we take an image of the Petri dish and how we've trained our algorithms to interpret real time what's growing on that plate. And we're making an active autonomous decision without the need of a microbiologist to intervene or, or to provide their own in, in interpretation. So it is true autonomous decision-making, which is why it's a, a class two medical device uh, from a US FDA perspective. Uh, and we've done all of the clinical trials. And this gets back to my earlier point. 
around where we're at in the maturity. We've got a platform technology. We've already got um, all, the, all the clinical trials and all the regulatory approvals in place. Uh, a huge publication portfolio now, which continues to grow. And you know the extension of our existing distribution agreement with Thermo Fisher uh, following the first 12 months in the US, now going into Europe in an expanded way, really demonstrates big companies uh, and, and their brand uh, and their sales organization and reach uh, behind our product, behind the technology. Uh, and that allows us to get into many more customers uh, in, a, in a scalable way. Next slide talks a, a bit more about kind of, you know, um, what that market opportunity looks like um, and, and, um, and specifically through this relationship with Thermo Fisher. Um, you know, we've increased uh, from 2,000 labs as our addressable market to 2,500 uh, labs, and that's adding these additional 30 countries in, uh, mainly, like I said, uh, all of Eastern and all of uh, Western Europe. And so, you know, this partnership, while it was signed at the very end of last year, and that's going to take some time. All of our energy is going now into, into launch planning, you know, and how we're going to effectively launch the product with Thermo Fisher uh, throughout this calendar year. And where, you know, there's going to be a, a team of us that will go across to uh, to Europe uh, this month and, and certainly over the uh, over the, over this current quarter in a really focused way to, to perform all of the, the onboarding and the training. And, and clearly some of that's done uh, remotely uh, as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and look, we have had commercial uh, traction. It's been a tough uh, couple of years uh, throughout COVID. Um, and really, you know, during that time, our customers uh, were the ones doing all of the COVID testing. And so effectively, you know, our ability to sell and get in to talk to our customers were shut off for a couple of years. That allowed us to really kind of focus on some of our technology development the, the APAS Pharma development kind of being one there as well as our antimicrobial resistance uh, module. So we, we didn't waste that effort. We, we reutilized our resources where we believe this is going to accelerate growth over, over future years. But it did constrain our ability to gain that commercial traction in that time period. Um, what we found is that when we appointed Thermo Fisher in that first kind of year, um, our sales cycles typically 12 to 15 months. Well, they purchased five instruments within that first, uh, first year of being appointed. Um, and we're starting to see a step change uh, at the end of last year, moving, you know, selling seven instruments. We've now got an, an install base globally of 13. And we would expect another step change as we kind of progress that commercialization moving uh, throughout calendar year 2023. The way the revenue model works is that there's an upfront capex. So the end user price is 300,000 US dollars. That's for the instrumentation itself. And then there's an annual software license of in the vicinity of, of, of $30,000. So that's an annual license that comes uh, directly to us. And so, you know, the way that Thermo typically sell this is on a, on a five year contract. Um, it bundles service and just gives that peace of mind to the customer. And so when you think of when we sell an instrument, the value across that period of time uh, is, is around that $450,000 uh, US dollars. So that's that kind of end user price. So, you know, an attractive revenue model where we've got some upfront uh, CapEx for the customer, uh, but then there's that annuity stream, which we've already expended all of the money developing the product. Um, and so that comes directly uh, to, to us as the company. Next slide. And we've come a long way. It's uh, it, it's taken certainly much longer than we expected and cost us uh, more than we would have expected as well. But uh, but we invented this core technology back in 2016, and that's where we received our first US FDA clearance. Uh, we had to do a de novo submission. That meant that there's no predicate that existed. Um, the predicate is a, a manual reading of the culture plate. Um, and so we, we led the way in that regard, and we've led the way in subsequent FDA and European regulatory clearances, whereby now we're, we, we have a product, we have a number of regulatory clearances, both in the US here in Australia uh, uh, and, and in Europe, to ensure that we can get out and sell the, sell the product. It's a platform technology where we've got the hardware and we've got an ability to develop the software, um, we call them analysis modules, to cater for a variety of infectious diseases. And that's kind of characterized by the number of plate media types you can see there on the screen. The appointment of Thermo Fisher, you know, happened and it was a really big step. And, and we did a lot of the groundwork whereby we did get obviously the regulatory approvals, 
but we're also able to get key opinion leader established. We generated early sales and, you know, they only put their name behind a product that they have confidence uh, in, in, in the product and its ability to have product market fit and for them to sell effectively into, into their customers. And look, looking beyond, you know, this year and moving beyond that, you can see some pictures there of an APAS compact. That's a smaller version of the instrument, the antimicrobial resistance, um, uh, petri dish there, and then moving into that pharma space, which I'll talk about um, uh, um, in a moment. Next slide. And what all of that means is that we've got an increased market opportunity. And so, you know, we've been developing the product focused very much on the clinical space. And that's a, you know, six and a half billion dollar market opportunity with our current product. So it remains a big opportunity. But I think importantly, what we're trying to now articulate is the significance of these more recent milestones and these agreements that we've been able to have with the likes of Thermo Fisher and AstraZeneca, who are now funding the development of our analysis module, the software to move into an expanded market in you know, the pharmaceutical microbial quality control market. And so that obviously increases the number of customers. It's a different customer base. It's a completely different vertical. Um, and, and with the APAS Compact, that smaller version of the instrument, again, we've received some funding through the government, through the CTCM um, yeah, institution there, which allows us to, to co-fund some of that development. So, you know, these announcements effectively have doubled our total addressable market. And, you know, we've only been able to do that based on what we've achieved in the clinical market because we've got a product. And, and now because we have a product, because it's validated in the market, we're getting investment from us, AstraZeneca, from Thermo Fisher, uh, to expand the current platform technology into these new verticals. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, just to again clarify the significance of this, so it's about 1.6 million or a bit under uh, funding that we've received from both AstraZeneca and Thermo Fisher. Um, Astra, AstraZeneca are keen to have a full validation uh, of the product. We're working with them in partnership. So we'll do all the verification, the development, um, but they're going to do the validation within their own sites. But, you know, rest assured, we're developing this not for one company, we're developing it for an industry. Um, there's a lot of standardization through manufacturing of drugs. In fact, it's a, it's a standardized process that's governed by, by the regulators. Uh, so consistency is really relevant and really important. And then Thermo Fisher are leaders in, in their media, and so they're supporting the media. Look, this is the, uh, the last three months um, market cap of, you know, around $22, $23 million. Um, and, uh, and these announcements have uh, increased the liquidity of our stock, but also provided a bit of a positive, uh, positive inflection point. Just being conscious of time, I think I'll look to wrap it up here and then open up to Q&A. You know, um, there is no better time to be in microbiology diagnostics. We've been at this for, for, for a few years now. And, you know, slowly but surely, we've been able to really tick off a lot of those boxes on the, on the development of the core product. And now most recently, we're, we're now delivering on that commercialization promise. We still have room to move. Uh, and so that's, that remains our key focus. But through these recent agreements, we're doubling the total addressable market. We've got some really big players behind us who are backing us, backing our technology, um, and, and a fair bit of blue sky on both the product development and the commercialization opportunity uh, that is ahead for the company. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Brent. Uh, lots of lots of questions as usual. Um, just in regards to AstraZeneca, for for example, looks like a, a very encouraging uh, deal. What happens to the intellectual property as part of that uh, project? Yeah, all of the IP remains with with the company. So the APAS platform is a platform technology, and so it's a machine learning decision tree algorithm based approach where we control the the image capture as well as the algorithm itself. And so what we're what we're effectively doing is that we're ex we're extending an existing technology. And so to that extent, it means that uh, you know there's no all all the IP remains owned by the company. And if there if there were to be any new IP generated through this, it would it would still remain with the company. So they're kind of helping you fund the the product the the project, and then does that enable you to then sell the product elsewhere as well outside of your partnership? Yeah, we're not encumbered. Um, in any way. Uh, and so it allows us to put in place appropriate commercial agreements uh, once the product is is, is ready to, to then go about distributing it in the most effective way. Uh, I would say Thermo Fisher clearly have 
made an investment. So already, I think it's it's obvious that they they would be an interested uh, partner uh, in that regard. And is there any more regulatory hurdles ahead of you in regards to being able to kind of sell the product globally? No, there, there's not. So we've got on the clinical side, we've got the regulatory clearances um, that we need to sell the product. Uh, on the environmental monitoring, the new area, uh, it, there's no regulatory body, if you like. We don't have to uh, apply to any regulator to get that product in, into the market. The manufacturing process is certainly a regulated process, but in terms of uh, automated plate reading, that in its own right is not a regulated activity. And, and there's a question uh, here from Peter. Where, where is the product actually manufactured? Yeah, it's manufactured in Melbourne, a company called Planet Innovation. They're quite well known uh, here domestically in Australia uh, as, a, as a real innovator and manufacturer of uh, medical equipment um, and, and diagnostic equipment. And, and, you, and you spoke about the addressable market, and uh, I think you had seven product sales uh, last year. What, and you talk about the target market. How many products are we talking about selling? Thousands here? How big? How does that pipeline look over the next, say, one to five years or so? Yeah, look, I mean, we obviously are putting binding forecasts in in anyway, but what we do see, it's it's certainly in the hundreds, and I think in the you know getting into, I don't want to even quote a thousand, but you know, I certainly think it's it, it's in the multiple hundreds when we look at the both the clinical market as well as the pharma market opportunity. And look, the, we've been developing the clinical application for years, and that's really about developing the platform technology. And so when we look at the pharma opportunity. We're not talking about a, another four or five years. We're talking about a relatively fast product development. We expect to have a product available, certainly for demonstration purposes this year and probably in the first half of this year. Um, and without the regulatory burden that we've needed to, to go through, all of that infrastructure is in place. So we expect a, a quicker uptake and, and the product, because of we're extending an existing um, technology, is, is also a little bit more straightforward. And Brent, just finally, is there any competitors in this space that are doing anything similar with similar technology? There are competitors in this space. So, um, and, and that's why it's really interesting AstraZeneca came to us because they assessed all of the uh, all of the competitors in the market and concluded that there are a few key issues with those competitors. One is that they weren't scalable. Uh, and two, that is that they had proprietary consumables that were linked to their product. And, uh, and they don't like that because it doesn't give them flexibility. And I'd say that's characterised more broadly uh, across the board. So there are competitors in the space. They're still emerging in terms of providing automation. It comes back to the fact that there still hasn't been huge investment in Petri dish automation, either in the clinical and also the environmental space. But, you know, we, we see those competitors helping communicate and to have that change management that automation can be done within the pharma space and we see significant differentiation between our product and theirs that allows us to stand alone uh, in our own right thanks brent um thanks for the story uh we'll catch up with you again in 2023 good luck out there mate thanks tim thanks all see you later uh next up we have spender osx code sbx market cap around 52 and a half million dollars we have with us and welcome back Adrian Flood, who's the CEO. Spender is a B2B fintech player offering a suite of software applications, payment and lending solutions and integration services. Adrian, thanks for your time. Over to you, mate. Mate, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Um, yeah, look, uh, as per the intro, my name's Adrian Flood. I'm the Managing Director of, of Spender, ASX Code SPX. Um, and I suppose today we're going to go a little bit of a journey of who we are and, and um, maybe a little bit on who we're not. So um, Spender's a, in the business, if you like, of building and funding resilient uh, digital supply chains. And we do that in partnership with our customers. And I suppose some people would characterise us as a fintech. And we certainly um, would, uh, you know, appreciate that label. But by the same token, we would certainly not characterise ourselves as a buy now, pay later. Um, next slide, please. Or two slides, as it were. Uh, I suppose the, the interesting thing to understand about ourselves um, is that we operate a platform uh, that connects the buyer and seller. And probably most importantly, um, builds on 20 years experience as a supply chain software vendor. And really probably the key thing to take away um, about that journey is as a supply chain software vendor, 
we got really good at sharing transactions between a buyer and seller, at integrating those transactions into uh, the respective trading partners' financials. And I suppose the automation of the order to cash or procure to pay cycles, which hopefully is jargon that people are a little bit familiar with, but look, in its simplest terms, what it means is that every supply chain starts off with production and there's a whole bunch of players that get goods to market and we in our, you know, in our home lives consume those products. And it probably doesn't really matter what those products are. And we've certainly taken that very horizontal approach to our product in that we're really completely market agnostic. Next slide, please. Uh, maybe I'll just give you the old pen nod if that works. Um, so look, as I said uh, before, we've, we've come off 20 years of, of experience in supply chain software, but, but the problem with that was always about the glass ceiling that's attached to a software company and its ability to only derive income, if you like, from licensing and implementation fees. So I suppose for us, what we wanted to do and, and uh, really uh, as a digital uh, journey was be able to monetize the, the, if you like, the flow of funds going through our platforms. So, so if you like, instead of saying, Mr. Customer, um, we're going to charge you $100 a month for our, for our software, we actually start saying, Mr. Customer, here's our software. It's a vending machine for all these kinds of transactions that you can do with your customers and your suppliers. And when you use them, we're going to charge you a percentage of, of the value of what goes through the pipe. Now, we've made that transformation over the past two years. And that really means that we've added payments and lending capabilities that allow us to charge those fees uh, and quite appropriately charge those fees, but probably moreover, allowing us to blend together different kinds of solutions that originate a transaction between a buyer and seller. And, and then if you like solve for a whole bunch of problems that relate to you know late payment, lack of resourcing for administration, automation of administration, removal of, um, if you like, disputes that exist between the buyer and seller. So we've really hit a whole bunch of business problems head on. But probably the best way for me to explain what we do and what the diversification in business model has done for us as an organization is just talk to the next slide, or three, as it were, uh, about, oh, no, no, sorry, go back. I just meant there's three slides on the topic. Um, <laughs> so this sort of flow describes a value chain, if you like, or a supply chain to market. And, and it's sort of a microcosm into the announcement we put out around carpet cord. But what it really highlights is our ability to compete all the way up and down the value chain, which, which allows us to have uh, both um, flexibility in pricing, but also that to, to really build a genuine partnership with our trading partners uh, such that we're not really uh, entering what you'd see as being competitive tension because we're not selling what we would see as being a one-dimensional product stream. So if we start out on the left, um, out here we've got a customer that wants to, to, in the case of carpet court, buy some soft furnishings or some, some carpet or, or, or whatnot. And typically those customers pay by card. So for us, we're able to offer the franchisee within the carpet court network, both the software to manage their business, so point of sale, service management, et cetera, as well as the payment services, whether they be terminal based or, or more um, contemporary digital services to capture those payments. So that's sort of putting us competing with, you know, the payments vendors of this world, um, and both in the terminal technologies, et cetera, as well as point of sale vendors, et cetera. But then where we move is a step further. So we're able to now turn around and using either our pay statement by link product or our spend AP product offer like an internet banking service that's fully integrated to that businesses, that retail businesses ledger. So when they make a payment, they send a remittance advice. It actually acts as a payment allocation file for the, the head office, if you like, or, or the, the carpet court um, uh, corporate entity 
that's acting as the primary supplier. So all of a sudden we've shifted from, I'm gonna make you a payment like a, a bill presentment platform or a standard EFT where there's actually no processing benefit. So I, I send you a payment, but you still got to reconcile it. You still got to post it. You've got to do all that work. And you know we've digitized that stream such that when I make a payment, it hits the ledger of, of the seller and updates it such that reconciliation is optimized. Disputes are removed. If you like, we construct a virtual ledger between the buyer and seller, as well as move the transactions. So when the seller invoices the customer, we deliver that transaction to their ledger. So we're just eliminating duplication and the whole concept of the, the debtor creditor uh, sort of relationship getting out of sequence. So there's our second income stream, um, where again, we monetize that flow, but then we can value add to that. So really standard terms of trade uh, between a buyer and a seller might be end of month plus 30 days. So the buyer and seller trade for the, for, for, for the month, and then at the end of the month, a statement's sent, and then in 30 days time, that statement's due. Here's where lending kicks in. I'm a supplier, I'd quite like the money sooner, so we can disconnect those, if you like, the debt of the seller um, that's it's owed by the buyer from when the buyer actually pays. And all of a sudden, we could say to the seller, would you like to get paid on end of month plus one, but then offer the buyer the ability to go, would you like to actually have 60 days to pay? So take the 30 days you normally had and have, add another 30. And again, we're able to charge a fee for that and blend that in with all the same reconciliation benefits and collaboration benefits between the two businesses, but most importantly, providing liquidity where it's needed. So breaking the nexus of traditional banking and offering a service that, that not only optimizes the behavior of the human beings, but it connects those businesses together more closely and provides liquidity to the supply chain. So again, there's our next revenue line. And then finally, uh, if we look out and now we're operating as the corporate business and we want to now pay our suppliers, again, we can provide that payment framework with exactly the same product that the, the franchisee might use, but allowing that, that, um, that corporate entity to, to push payments out to their suppliers. Now, this is where things start to get even more interesting because our business is a platform. It's built on invitations. Every time we send a transaction, whether it's a request to pay, a remittance advice, um, or just a, just a straight invitation, we're always connecting the next part of the business. So our opportunity from, if you like, this node spoke strategy where we've won a relationship with Carpet Core is to then extend those relationships up and down that, that supply chain and do more for all of those businesses. Now, in our most recent announcement, we obviously um, you know, announced that this had a minimum transaction um, uh, fee income to us of 50 to 70 grand. But it's important to note that only related to the first part of the flow, just that, that payment going between the store and the head office. It had nothing to do with anything else I just mentioned. So nothing to do with payments from the consumer, nothing to do with extended lending for uh, the store and nothing to do with supplier payments or otherwise. Now, what we would expect is that those income streams in and of themselves are all in differing stages of implementation right now. Um, we'll continue to accelerate the opportunity and actually put the metrics in the market that show, unlike competitors in payment or competitors in lending uh, or competitors in, in SaaS, we're able to create this unique recipe that allows us to deliver a compelling ROI to our customer but also squeeze far more revenue out of that payment flow than anyone else that I'm presently aware of. Next slide, please. So obviously there's value everywhere. So for the end consumer, we're providing payment flexibility. You know, we're giving them the ability to pay um, cards without needing to present them, but without also having to, you know, read them out over the phone or use IVR services. So we're adding convenience and flexibility as well as the ability to administer when you know you might want to pay, like control the direct debit, which is a really novel concept in our in our auto pay feature. For the franchisee, we're giving them, uh, if you like, the ability to, to earn discounts from their supply line with early payment, but also uh, if you like access lending and optimize their reconciliation 
um, or administration resources who are you know in in the business of processing payments within that business. We do exactly the same thing for the franchise or, but because we're we're able to build resilience into that whole network, a big part of our mission is to make that that franchise business even more attractive to new franchisees. So we grow together. And then finally, down to the supply line, we're providing that liquidity, we're providing that reconciliation benefit. So we're delivering those benefits downstream and then hopefully scaling out into that, that, uh, that if you like, that connected customer network. So all of this stuff's like really coming to life now uh, and, and we're starting to move with, with, with some, um, some really pleasing uh, velocity and results. Next slide, please. Which kinds of lead, leads into you know what's been happening for us. So if if we if we look at the past couple of years, we've had extremely modest growth um, in you know sorry revenues going back a couple of years when we sort of hit that that transformation point, and then we started to to grow and grow. We've had I think ten quarters of consistent growth, um, you know, and, and those those consistent growth quarters most pleasingly have also involved us moving to a recurring income model. So if we look at our, our September quarterly, we announced 95% of our income was recurring in nature. We also announced at that time what we thought we'd get to in terms of um, you know, capital out the door in our lending business. And, and I suppose all that was really about where did we think our ARR was going to get to. Now, if you consider the carpet court transaction and what's been announced, we're really talking about what a 20 odd, if not 25% growth in that recurring income stream from the first component of that transaction. So we're really closing the gap between uh, our income and, and our cost structure um, every month. And that we're probably, if we were, if we were looking at the, the cricket worm, um, we're right on track at, at midway through the year to you know, achieve that goal of, uh, of cash flow positive um, in this financial year. Uh, so that's a really pleasing thing from the organization's perspective. And obviously we're at reporting season time. So, you know, shortly the market's gonna be informed about what did our performance look like in, in the December quarter. And again, I believe we'll be, we'll be positioning that continuing trajectory to close the gap. And I suppose what, what we feel is that the market is going to start to wake up to not just our potential, but our reality. Uh, next slide, please. And I suppose we might need a, one more tap. There we go. I suppose what I'm referring to is it would be fair to say over the past, you know, sort of um, maybe say, say, say January 21 to now, we probably have never really been valued on pure fundamentals. And, you know, we've been dragged up and down with market momentum, but we were very fortunate to put away a transaction um, that gave us the capital to be able to build this business and build on the vision. And I suppose while we've continued to grow, the market's not necessarily been particularly kind to us, but obviously we're seeing some resilience come back now uh, into the share price. Um, we would expect that we're putting enough information into the market now that analysts are able to uh, really look at our business from, from a fundamentals perspective and understand uh, why we believe we're on the right trajectory and why uh, organisations continue to want to work with us. And I suppose, um, I guess before I take some questions, I'll just sort of close with, you know, as, as we're focused on closing the gap, um, really, We've got some exciting stuff coming in terms of our tech releases in the near term around our, our wallet capability uh, and the expansion of our AP product as an integrated internet banking service. And what that's really doing for us is allowing us to create very sticky income streams uh, that allow us to upsell and, and derive value for our customers as well as increase our income, um, which, is, which is, you know, it's, it's really exciting times and it's very satisfying to see that is where we are at. So without further ado, I guess I'll take some questions. Thanks, Adrian. The, uh, the stock market can be a very unkind place sometimes. Um, 
I, I suppose that one of their questions is in regards to to margins. I, I kind of see this as a margin business, and and that brings into the question of where what are your source of funds for you know lending, for example. So can you kind of talk through? You recently announced the establishment of a thirty uh, fifty million debt warehouse in the second half of the year. How will that be kind of utilised and and help drive your revenue? Well, at the moment, so I think if you look at our, our revenue drivers to, you know, and the things which which help us achieve our goals in terms of, of um, you know, crossing through the, the cash flow positive threshold, um, uh, you know, we've, we've announced our $50 million facility and, you know, we're very laser focused in in the near term. We're not really looking for new deals per se. We've got, we just need to roll out and we'll hit that, you um, that sort of fifty percent utilization, you know, by the by the half year, and I think that's probably um, that that's sort of objective one for us. Um, one of the things that we're able to do with that bundling is probably move away from quoting rates, where we're going, you know, we're we're fifteen percent or whatever the number is. Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, obviously, we 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 demonstrated a much higher yield on our book than that, and through that sort of blurring of the lines. Um, but and I think again, you know, our our, our cost of funds um, is is a fixed cost of funds. We've been very fortunate there as well. We've we've not had any rate increases through this this period of time, so that that's been been fantastic. Um, but there's plenty. So that, look, we've 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 got plenty of um, plenty of margin across the board. If you, same thing with our payments, you're probably looking consistently. Um, you know, every dollar of flow, we, we're, we're probably at, at a minimum trying to derive a 1% um, yield from. And that, you know, that's on a monthly basis. And and so the, the three parts of the business model are the kind of the SaaS, the, the subscription service, the payments and the lending. How do you see these three kind of different segments evolving over the next uh, year or so? Uh, well, we probably have always thought that, that that the software would be a vending machine. We don't see it as being the big, the big win. And uh, it, it's a very important win. But if I give you an example, if we were to do a deal with a customer, and, and this is not you know, special knowledge, and let's just say we said our integration software per customer was 100 bucks a month. Um, and we rolled that out to like a carpet court network. There's only a couple of grand in income there. Um, but without the software, you cannot do the lending and payment transaction in an automated fashion. You're back to, it's how we break the competitive tension. So the software in and of itself um, is, is, we'll call it the, the, the workhorse that's maybe underappreciated from a revenue perspective. Um, so we'd probably always expect that to be the lowest contributor. However, the most critical element to enabling payments and lending. And we would always see them kind of roughly running the same sort of race. Because if you think about a lend, every time you do a lend, you've got two payments anyway, one to advance the funds and one to get, one to get them back. So you, with those ecosystems are constantly working with one, one another. We've got sort of two um, loan management stacks in our spender lending services. And then the spender payment services and lending services are constantly interacting. So they feed off one another. We would always expect them to be roughly the same amount of revenue. Um, there's deals where you know there's more payment and less lending. There's deals where there's more lending and less payment. It's part of the reason why we started talking about sort of total flow uh, through the platform because um, that dynamic can change. But importantly, we don't care if you how how you're moving the money through the platform. We're going to monetize it one way or the other. And, and Adrian, you've got um, some fanatical shareholders. I, I've taken a screenshot here out of, out of Twitter, and it was a a list of things to ask. And uh, one of them is in oh. regards to kind of some of the franchise buying groups that you're, you're targeting in particular. Could you, could you address that if you may? Yeah, I mean, look, we've, we've made it really clear that for some time now that our strategy was node spoke. Um, so node being the guy in the middle, the spokes being the people that they trade with, or in the, in the case of, of Carpet Court, Carpet Court National Office is the node and the stores are the spokes. Um, there's no question that we're, we're uh, chasing down other um, opportunities in that same space. The, you know, there's, there's a, and there's also no question that we're also delivering other 
um, you know, franchise groups at, at differing scale. And I think the thing to understand for us is the changing nature of material. So the faster we accelerate revenue, the less we're going to talk about the opening of every envelope. Um, obviously, carpet court is a, was a, was a significant achievement, and we're extremely thankful for that win. Um, but you know, look, we'd expect that the market would be informed of any material buying group or franchise group announcement, and um, we certainly uh, are working with a few. And and I've just got this kind of list here. It's kind of uh, eBev, Fresh Supply Company. Grain Corp, James Tyler, are they the sort of names that, uh, as I said, you've got some fanatical shareholders, so they don't miss a trick. Are they the sort of uh, groups you're still in discussions with? And, and is there any update on those sort of um, deals? Yeah, oh, look, I mean, those 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 names all sound pretty familiar to me. Um, mm. I think that, that the key thing is some of those, yeah, I mean, the, when, when you've got a customer and it's steady state, you know, the materiality of those things sort of fades to, back, to black. Uh, so you, we'd probably only be looking at updating the market if there was a material change. So if we, if we, if we were to lose a big customer, um, but we're, we're not anticipating that. Um, but those names, are, you know, sound like some of the people we, 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 we are working with or, or um, but there's certainly, you know, there's, there's deals that aren't on that list that, uh, between us and, and, and our customer. And as I said before, our pipeline is, is, is just about delivering into. So to hit our revenue goals, to hit the goals that we want, we just need to deliver. So it's, it's a, it, you know, and we would hope to be sort of halfway done with Carpet Court by the end of Feb. And, and part of that from, a, from the business perspective is, is, is balancing our own internal capacity. So a lot of the things that we're looking at is how do we do this over time um, such that we can can implement effectively uh, and and meet the customer's needs um, concurrently with you know our own internal capabilities because you know as a growing organization you you tend to have um, a core of expertise and 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 you've got to spread that knowledge and be willing to you know let people make mistakes um, learn and hope they learn from them uh, and learn quickly so you know we we're probably past the fail fast mentality now and more into the execute fast and get better and better at that. And Adrian, just a final question. Um, overseas markets, is it that a, a, a bit of a step too far at the moment, given your focus here in Australia? Oh, maybe not. Um, look, uh, <laughs> there's, there's no secret we've got a structure um, in, in India and a structure in Singapore. That's, that's, not, that's old news. Um, it's important to understand that, that there's licensing obligations in different markets and standing those up is very important. Uh, it would be fair to say that we've, we've probably for 18 months now articulated our strategy would be to, to follow uh, exported goods abroad and look at how we can participate in those transactions. And that's certainly what, you know, the James Tyler uh, question you alluded to that's what that was about and, and we've done a few things in that space to, to learn the game and perfect the craft and develop the product that we think can scale and um, yeah so I, I wouldn't I don't think our near-term focus is to try and stand up businesses in 55 countries hmm. um, our near-term focus uh, is, is just about achieving that principal objective of, of going through the cash flow positive horizon on the back of that, we obviously want to have uh, scaled out systems that will allow us to take on bigger markets. You know, uh, we want to have a much tighter tempo and even the right, uh, I'll say, execution flow for how we AML KYC, meet Austrack compliance. There's a lot more moving parts of this thing than uh, to go outside of Australia than, than maybe might meet the eye. But um, it's certainly it's it's certainly in the on the on the twenty three plan, but but not like like not next week. How about that? Understood, um, Adrian. That's all we have time for. I hope twenty twenty three is good to spend her, and uh, we'll catch up with you later in the year. Thanks for your time. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. That's all we have time for. Uh, we'll be back not next week because we've got Australia Day on Thursday. We expect everyone to have a long weekend. We'll be back the week before, which is uh, early Feb. Thanks for your time, everyone. Have a good weekend.